Jesse Hanna. <laughs> right, Yo, John. what's up? How's it going, dude? How's it going? Oh, man. Yeah. First, look. Is this too bright? I have this, like, desk lamp that's, like, right on me. Yeah, honestly, I mean, it's, it's kind it of Does it look a, fine? Yeah, it's just kind of a, it, It's one of those things in a, in a production where, you know, a good enough is probably uh, fine. <laughs> how do I get rid of, like, how do I make it just so I'm looking at you, or am I going to be on the screen the whole time? Uh, you're going to be on the screen the whole time, oh, unless okay. if you're if you're wanting to turn off um, if you're wanting to turn off the camera. Let me see. Um, I just want to. I just don't want to be on the screen. <laughs> okay. Like if I could just stare at you, it would be like more natural, you know. But whatever. <laughs> yeah. but this is fine. This okay. is the first time I've done this. Uh, done right, Instagram yeah, yeah, live. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I uh, I'm trying to look at the different features here. If it looks like I'm just fucking staring at you, hold on a second. Um, let's see, turn off, request to go live, off question, but, uh, I don't see anything as far as with the, the camera. I'll have oh, to look yeah. into that, I think... doggy. I apologize. <laughs> it's, see. no, it's cool. It's all good. Okay. All right, cool. Well, you know, I, you know, we'll, we'll start digging into this and we'll make it a little bit more natural and kind of laid back, uh, here I'm going on you live, sure. we're gonna, you know, dig into the earlier days and things, you know, where the interest started and, and, and kind of, you know, uh, jump right into, you know, some of the stuff more recently, as far as. Uh, bands and different things that you have going on nowadays, you know, even things outside of, you know, as far as photography and editing credits, you know, all, all sorts of different stuff. A lot of really cool shit going on. Uh, you have a really sweet, it seems like a horror community that's local to you in a, in a theater that Definitely. shows some movies as well. Uh, so I, I'm so stoked to dig into all of this, my man. But first of all, let me say thank you for taking the time tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm totally stoked for, uh, for the chat. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> no worries. Like I'm excited to do this. So, <laughs> oh yeah, awesome. All right, well, so so let's start here. You know, as far as uh, you know, now able to to hold a physical copy of something of your own. To bring us back to the first time buying or receiving a cassette or a, or a CD. And what what was that? What was that first that you received? Yeah. So, <clears throat> my dad was really into music. Um, the earliest stuff I can remember is like obviously his taste, but like it was a huge, it was like very influential on me. But it was um, like the the cranberries, everybody's doing it. I don't even <laughs> really know the title. It's just the one with like dreams and linger on it. It's like everybody's <laughs> doing it, okay. so why can't we or something like that? Um, so it was that and um, Alanis Morissette's. Um, jagged little pill it's funny when you're recording like everything you like love is, is like hard to like immediately come to like the titles and stuff but uh yeah, yeah Alanis Morissette and the Cranberries uh he also was really obsessed with uh the Mariah Carey Christmas album <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> which, yeah which is cool love like that. this was all like early 90s so like I, I was born in the late 80s and uh so it was like right before like it's, you know, it's like when you start to become cognitive of like what's um, musically around you and like, and you start to, you know, your taste develops that way. So like, those are the ones that stick out to me that I didn't personally own, but um, they were just always in his uh, truck. We would just constantly listen, flip through the tapes on those. Um, I'm sure there was more, but those were the ones I like really liked. Um, but yeah. That's where it started. Sick. Sick. I love that. What well, what about the the first time, you know, as far as uh within a band that you were in that you actually get pressed something? May it have been, you know, some bootleg CDs or a, a cassette and you actually got to bring it home and listen to like, whoa, I'm playing on this. Well, yeah. where where did that come in? Um, so that just reminded me, I wasn't even gonna say this, but when I was younger, like I'd make all my like cousins be in like a band with me. Um we didn't even have like uh it wasn't like a real band. It was just like entirely just like the image. So I would just like make these, like I would take like the, the J card or the, not the J cards, but the trays out of CDs and like, you know, make your, make our own art, even though it was just like <laughs> handwritten and stuff. So like, so like, and then we would like make up titles and like, even though there's like no music at all, but like I used to do that with my cousins before I actually learned uh, how to play like an instrument. Uh, but the first time we, and that's the thing is like, we used to do like the home burnt CDR thing. Um, uh -huh. And that was, we uh, like my bands before, like I was, I started playing with other people in like middle school and uh, high school too. 
nothing but nothing like serious so it was like we just did the like hand you know handwritten cdr burned at home uh you know glued on covers not even if that uh <laughs> but the the first time we actually like had a cassette was um it was my first band after high school, which was like the first band we really took seriously. Um, we, mm. we made our own cassettes. So uh, that was really fulfilling actually, like doing it all ourselves. Like we like, I, I had, st it, this was actually before I started my label, but the cassette release was like the first thing that I'd done where it was like dubbed them, you know, went to Kinko's and printed the J cards and uh, you know, cut them ourselves. And like, I don't know. There wasn't templates online back then. This was like 2008, 2009. So like, I just remember grabbing old cassettes that I had and like measuring uh, their J card and just like, you know, replicating that right. as best as I could. But now it's like, everyone has it easy. <laughs> and they have, they have yeah. like, yeah. like you could also get like things pro produced now too whereas like i think the only place doing stuff back then was a national audio company and their minimums were 100 uh 100 cassettes minimum and that was like definitely not something we were selling back then so <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's so funny that you bring up the fact and this has nothing to do with a band that i was ever in but uh my my best friend and i we used to do these things we would call them i want to rock compilations and it was like all of like the best, it would be like 10 tracks from like the eighties and it would be like the best songs of 1982. And we would like make all of the back art and the cover art <laughs> and you're talking oh, about yeah, yeah. Part of the jewel case and everything. That was something that we used to do, you know, where it would like, you, you would, you would make the, the little side panel art and all this shit. And Oh my yeah. God. I think of that now. That's, absolutely hilarious <laughs> <laughs> but i mean you know it was just kind of one of those things too where it was like an added you know like bonus of like oh man you know we can look into doing art with this and what could we do for the cd to make it stand out and yeah uh, it was it was ridiculous and you, you you might fuck around and put a little too much you know like uh paste on the the picture that you put on it gets stuck in the cd player and oh, yeah yeah so no, i remember <laughs> one of my uh one of my friends we were like we were all like when we were doing the handwritten cdr things like we would all do them separately so it was like depending on which copy you got like there was like five different people's handwriting <laughs> but like i remember one of my friends was like spelling the word uh blasphemy wrong or something because that was one of our song titles and he was like dude it doesn't fucking matter like he's like <laughs> it's like dude we're like a metal band it doesn't matter if we have misspelling it's just it's just hilarious how it went from like that <laughs> to like late years later just like doing like insane packaging and like you know working with youth attack and stuff so totally totally yeah <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, and, 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 i mean yeah that is kind of funny too you know with like set, kind of the juxtaposition of even earlier ideas you know earlier kind of like goofy off the wall stuff and then actually having something like youth attack and you know some of the merch items that they've had you know along with some of their you know some of their stuff that's like whoa this is like some of those things that you know come across you know as far as like the the, the popcorn or some of you know the kind of gimmicky you yeah. know fun items that come along with the uh, the releases you know like, man this dude is really like thinking back and just like going for it you know like not giving a shit at all so I appreciate yeah. that. I love the hell out of it. <laughs> Having both the, the, the physical releases. Uh, as far as what was, you know, a, a first CD that comes to mind as far as that you bought with your own money, you know, may have been a paycheck or, you know, something that you were saving up for, uh, you know, kind of after some of your own personal interests developed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it wasn't okay. It wasn't technically with my own money, but my dad used to do those uh, like, cd mail order things where you oh, like yeah. buy one get 12 free or something something like that like it was it was uh yeah it was something like that i can't remember if it was uh it was like through one of the record labels or something so like yeah he basically was just like hey i'm gonna buy four of these cds you can pick out the rest um and um i the one that sticks out to me is like green day dookie but um, okay. I had other ones, too, that I really like. I mean, I owned, like, back then, I would just buy CDs, even if I just liked the uh, single or whatever from the radio. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, uh, you know, the rest of the album sucked. But Green, Day, <laughs> Green Day's Dookie was great. So, I mean, that still is to me. So 
But yeah, I mean, I can think of like, I had the freaking Wallflower CD that just had the one good song. <laughs> like, I don't remember anything else. From that <laughs> uh, but like, I don't know, later on when I got a job, I did, uh, I did, this was later in high school, like 2005. I, when I got a job and this, you know, 2005 was a point where like you easily could burn CDs. Uh, I think I had a CD burner even. But I still was buying music a lot. Like even, you know, mm -hmm. all, most of my paychecks from work were just uh, CDs or uh, paying for gas. So yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I just I remember having one of those visors just like riding around my car, like the visors on both sides just with the CD rack. And like, uh, I don't know, I was just buying CDs like constantly during that period. Uh, I love that. Were, were there any, you know, that like had to be in that visor rack, you know, as far as like, if you were going up there and flipping through and it wasn't there, I was like, oh, it's going to be a bad day. Um, no, because I had, like, I had, like, both visors. So I had, like, the the back side of the visor and then, like, the front side on both sides. So I pretty much, like, <laughs> I had, oh, like, God. everything that I wanted, like, at easy, you know, reach. Because a lot of people had those, like, CD binders that they would keep in the back seat. And it's like, I don't – how do you flip through this, like, if you're, you know <laughs> – so but all, all of that stuff that i'm talking <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and you're driving which is ironically like less distracting than trying to search for something on spotify like while you're driving <laughs> now like right uh, uh shit that is funny but uh, yeah so like I, this i'm just trying to think of cds ahead. from i definitely bought like my chemical romance like fallout boy like that was kind of the stuff i mean obviously i have okay. like hardcore stuff too but i'm just like i'm trying to name stuff that's like I guess not as obvious, like because yeah, we're gonna yeah, okay. get we're gonna get into the the underground shit later. So right, right for sure. And and I, I you you kind of mentioned something too as far as like within the nineties and and having you know CDs where you buy it and it was just the single. I felt like for the longest time like that was such a stigma and it was kind of one of those things that drew me toward hardcore was starting to get some of the CDs that I was getting where I was like, whoa, you know, like it's not just one or two of these songs that are cool. Or, you know, if somebody picked up a corn CD and they would just wanted to throw that on, it's like half of these tracks are like sounds. It's not even a, a song. At all. <laughs> like, you know, you have a 13 track album and it's like half of this it's is star sound effects. What is happening? It starts on <laughs> track 13. I mean, yeah. okay. So that was with I did corn, like that. Yeah. With corn. I mean, that was like, I, I guess what I, what I'm trying to say is like early on, I was just kind of into what was ever, whatever was on the radio and like, yeah, some of it still s sticks to this day. I mean, I loved Nirvana, but I didn't really get obsessed with Nirvana until like probably 2000, 2001. Like it was like middle school for me. So uh, my sister though is older. I have two sisters, but I only grew up with one of them. So I'm like, mm -hmm she was like the coolest person in the world. I mean, she still kind of is to me. Like she's always that she was always like, you know, she's 10 years older than me. So when I was five, she was like 15 and, uh, oh, you know, I was like young driving around with them and they were like sneaking cigarettes and, you know, listening to smashing <laughs> pumpkins and stuff. And it's like, to me, it is their teenage years were just like the Smashing Pumpkins uh, 1979 music video. Which <laughs> okay. <was> like, <laughs> yeah, because they're just like, you know, getting into trouble, drinking in the graveyard, you know, stuff like I just thought they were like the coolest people and, you know, still kind of do. So, yeah, okay. So I don't even know what the question was, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, did Did she introduce you, you know, as far as like, even a little bit of a further path as far as like music or introduce you to different things or even movies or a taste, you know, that was, uh, uh, kind of what, what, uh, earlier interests were, were brought to you. Yeah. So yeah, she would, like I said, she would drag me along to honestly, now that I'm looking back, I think she had to watch me a lot and <laughs> she oh, hated okay. that, um, uh, a lot of times people thought like I was her kid, which made no sense. She was like 17 and I was like six years old. So, <laughs> you know, it, that yeah. doesn't, but like people Weird. did think that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so she, I went and saw scream on the opening night back in 96 when it came oh. out. And that's like one of the, yeah, I was only like six or seven. Uh, I think I had just turned seven. So, yeah, that was like Dang. that was crucial. Uh, 
And like my dad is really into horror. My dad is basically like the main person who uh, showed me like the really good stuff. My sister was into all the 90s stuff, but now she's more into like rap and hip hop, which I dabble <laughs> okay. in, but I mean, I'm not like super, you know, I'm not like, I'm not really current with really any contemporary music, like especially post pandemic. I just kind of traveled backwards, you know, like uh, trying to pick up some of the pieces that I like maybe missed out on. Like right now I'm really obsessed with uh, David Bowie and like the Beatles. That's what I've been listening to like, oh, this shit. week. Okay. So have you, uh, yeah. have you, have you seen the documentary they have on Hulu? Uh, the, the Beatles thing. Oh, the Beatles thing. No, I was actually talking to my roommate about that. We've never seen like any of the Beatles like documentaries or the, even the movies they've made. Uh, so I don't know. It's probably it's something pretty- that I'm going to get into. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of one of those things where Die Hard or not, I think it's a really cool thing that they, you know, A, had filmed for all these years, and then it wasn't anything that, you know, like surfaces until now. Um, and then, uh, God, I'm forgetting, Peter Jackson uh, was the one who directed it. Uh, oh, which yeah, it isn't yeah, anything horror related, but it is, you yeah, know, it's yeah, pretty yeah. sick as far as like, just, you know, even musicians looking into the 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 process of other musicians and how, you know, they kind of go in and what they, what they do and starting to write some of the, you know, songs that are still, you know, as iconic now as they were when they were released. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely sick. I mean, just as far as even like a, a musical, uh, interest, you know, it's something kind of, kind of cool to check out for sure. Yeah. For ages recently. I mean, I feel like there's all sorts of different things where you really? look back and you're like, ah, I just, artist and maybe maybe now's the time to check it out <laughs> yeah. so i i can dig that for sure um yeah you, so you mentioned as far as yeah you were uh, cutting you know, out for a second oh was it oh okay let's see here yeah maybe it's, but yeah, i think uh, you're good now let's let's try something hold on a second. A little goofy so i want wanted to wanted to pause that real fast and see <laughs> okay I got you back. Okay, is that good? I think right. so. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. I my Wi-Fi every once in a while gets kind of uh, goofy, so I just pause that. And when I go in to edit this, I'll cut this all out so it's not just uh, us farting oh, around talking good. about fucking Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you stated, you know, the only way to find out about shows were flyers and word of mouth after moving to De- to, to Denver recently within the last years. Uh, you know, continuing in that vein, tell us about discovering new music from multiple routes, such as, you know, reading uh, albums, thank you notes, or, or seeing a show flyer, or maybe even a video game or movie soundtrack. Uh, what, are, what are some bands that come to mind that you've been introduced through uh, any of these routes? Yeah, so uh, the ma- I would say the main, so we were talking about Korn earlier, like the late 90s is basically when Freak on a Leash came out, Mm -hmm. that's when i was like i need to get into whatever this is like i i I didn't i didn't know what corn was before that like until follow the leader came out but you know Mm -hmm. there was other heavy stuff going on at the time like limp biscuit was you know sort of stewing uh like kid rock had that hit song so like i think it was i guess it would have been like 98 is that when follow the leader came out uh, so that's about right. Yeah. yeah. So that's when I was getting into heavy stuff. But I mean, you know, that's still that's still on the radio. Like, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't until 2001 or 2002, whenever uh, Headbangers Ball came back on uh, oh, to yeah. MTV2. Uh, that was like, that was, I mean, it's so corny because, like, now we're 20 years removed from that. But, like, even when the original show aired, like, people were like, oh, that was, like, our, that was our religion. That was our, you know, every, <laughs> every Saturday night. But it was, like, not hyperbole. Like, all of my friends and I, was, every Saturday that we were, like, at home, we would just throw on Headbangers Ball and, like... <laughs> It's like it's kind of like the TV's in the background. You're talking. You're hanging out, and uh, if something catches your eye, you'll be like, "Oh, this! What the fuck? You know, what is this? This is crazy." So I think I, I discovered a few like pretty pivotal bands that moved me out of new metal and into like metalcore and more uh, underground stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know who was programming that. I mean, obviously, a lot of. Uh, it just came down to who, which labels had money to, 
to you know put the their videos on there but uh yeah yeah. So like the first one I remember is uh, Norma Jean, the <laughs> the music video for Face to Face. I was like, <laughs> I just like didn't understand what was going on. The music was so complex and chaotic to me, and I you know I would have been like, I think I we found them out when we were like fourteen or thirteen, okay. and uh, yeah, I was just like, what is this? Like, and you know the the music video too. It's like the aesthetic was so cool. They had kind of like the this old, you know, the album artwork to their first album is all this old. I don't know. It kind of looks like um, a horror version uh, of like a twenties or thirties type imagery. Like yeah. it's just very. It's like old, sort of Victorian. Like kind of looks creepy, but their music video was so cool because like they just weren't they didn't really care to feature themselves it was they, it was kind of like dimly lit and they were just kind of like you know going off and i was just like this whatever this is is much cooler than you know limp biscuit or whatever where you know <laughs> it's all about ego with like that those kind of bands and then you know so from there yeah i bought um so because I knew about Norma Jean at a hot topic, I bought the Hellfest 2003 DVD. Oh yes. Okay. And that that's, I mean, just consider it over after that. Like, <laughs> really? You just watched the whole thing and just picked out the bands that I liked. Uh, obviously I didn't like everything. Like there's like pop punk stuff on there that I didn't care for, but yeah, that's where I found about uh, the locusts and daughters and, uh, walls of Jericho and stuff, you know, stuff that doesn't obviously doesn't hold up, but like it just blew the doors open, like the red cord. Um, yes. And then it's just, it's just so weird that when you're growing up, everything that it's probably completely different now. I mean, kids, I don't know how kids, fi kids find there's everything is so niche. So it makes sense that kids follow some rapper or something that I've never heard of, you know, some SoundCloud rapper <laughs> yeah, right. with, with a million, you know, followers. But back then it was the radio and the mainstream was an anomaly, you know, it's like actually cool music actually was on the radio for a lot of, and like, I'm saying that and under, I'm not, I'm not saying that as like, Oh, it was cool then, but it's not cool now. It's just like nobody listens to the radio. Like that's the difference yeah. now. Yeah. So yeah. listening to the radio back then was how I formed my taste because it, it just kind of like made a progression, you know? And then from there I was able to find more underground stuff. But the, the when I found that Hellfest DVD, it was like pulling back a veil or something like all these bands had existed in the same CD racks that I was already looking through, but it's mm -hmm. like, you wouldn't know. I mean, unless you knew what label they were on or, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. so when right. I, yeah, when I found those uh, bands, it was just like, okay, Best Buy carries some of this stuff. I remember buying like a dead to fall CD at uh, Walmart because <laughs> they had like victory record stuff was sold at Walmart. Holy shit. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, Damn. and then, so some, but then some of it, once it started getting more obscure, I would have to custom order stuff through Barnes and Noble. And that's what mm. we did all of, I don't know. There was some, I think somebody in, so that's another thing. I grew up in Peoria. It's not, we didn't have like a cultural institution. There wasn't, by the time I started getting into music, I think the like main record store had already closed, which I only like heard whispers of it when I grew up grew older you know like i never got oh, to go okay. there so there wasn't like some cool clerk you know handing us you know minor threat or something like that so <laughs> yeah we had to figure it out all our, all on our own so like you know mtv2 hellfest hot topic to a degree and then i'm trying to think uh so i was going to new metal shows this is kind of I don't know. You can ask the next question because it's all, it's all like, <laughs> it all is connected, you know, like it's, you know, 13 and 14 years old. So, well, you, you kind of started touching on that just as far as, uh, you know, as far as being introduced to your local scene, you know, and, and, and being yeah. introduced to, you know, having these interests and, you know, kind of stumbling upon like, Oh shit, you know, like maybe I can check out a show that's local to me. Uh, tell us about the, for the first time going to a local show and then maybe even like, your first time going to like a big bill concert, you know, like a, a big touring package or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
the first so the first show i went to this was this all it was like an all local i don't even know i cannot remember how i heard about it it must have been from like the radio we had like a hard rock butt rock new metal station <laughs> called we everyone from peoria will know when i say this it hasn't been called this for 20 years but 99x is what it was called and they changed okay. their name in like 2004 to they just changed stations because they like they got this like they basically bought a different company and like were able to uh, broadcast farther. But it's it's called one hundred five seven the X now. But back in the day, I mean, in the nineties, they would play everything good. Like it was basically just an alternative radio station that played you know anywhere from Green Day to Nirvana to whatever. So then later in the 90s, it switched to new metal and, you know, the early 2000s was, it, you know, the post new metal, like re grunge era thing with like puddle of mud and shit. Like <laughs> that's what they were playing. Um, so I think I heard about this show from them, but it was over the summer of 2001 and it was all local bands and I didn't know a single one of them. I just like went with my, <laughs> with my mom and cousin and uh, her mom. And they would just like awkwardly stare, stand on the, <laughs> stood on the side with us. And we just like watch these bands. Uh, so from there, I kind of was like, the radio still was the, the place that was telling me where to go to shows. Uh, and then I okay. saw, I think I saw Mudvayne. Mudvayne's from Peoria. So yeah. Totally, that, yeah. So I used that, to love them, man. I can't lie. You said oh, Peoria, and I'm like, oh shit, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you're, are you from Grand Rapids or just somewhere up by Detroit? Out, outside, yeah, out of the west side of the state. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Outside so of Grand outside Rapids. Grand yep. Rapids. Okay. I've yep. never been there, but I mean, it's the the Midwest is it's, kind of the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you probably had a little bit of separation, but like from like des moines to columbus is like the like new metal rust bell <laughs> like i guess yeah. maybe even to pittsburgh a bit but i don't know like but yeah. yeah like so there's just kind of like the best and i and i say this like lovingly but it's just kind of like a devoid of culture like everyone kind of was just this like I don't I don't know how to describe it other than just saying new metal. Like that's yeah, yeah. still like Peoria's vibe is like new metal. It's either new metal or like uh rap, like hip hop. So yeah, there's sure. really no in between. Even if you're even if you don't listen to that kind of music, you just kind of like have that persona. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um but uh, the, for the for chain the, wallet. You, oh yeah for sure like <laughs> we had like a hot topic store before hot topic uh i'm sure most places did but it was uh i never actually got to go there but it was called the dungeon and uh we did have like a co-op records uh yeah so the but like those places were kind of like the co-op i started going to co-op when i was older but like it was mostly a head shop you know oh, it was like okay. You know, it was like that kind of vibe. Like, uh, yeah. you walk in and there was like a few used CDs. They didn't start carrying records until later, but, uh, okay. but yeah, that's what I mean. Like when we were in high school, I was shopping at there was a there was a record store chain or CD store chain called um, Coconuts that I went to in the nineties. Sam Goody in the mall. Yeah. Um, okay. Barnes and Noble. That was like the best place to get custom stuff. I can even recall like the, the few CDs I had special ordered there. Uh, and, <laughs> okay. be and, and Best Buy. Like that. Th those were our places. Okay. Did you guys have Circuit City or no? Was that? Yeah, we did. I don't know why, oh, okay. but it just felt like um, it just we never went there. I don't know. We only went there when they went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh and this is you know not even like uh, off topic of music but did you guys have a sun coast video oh absolutely absolutely dude uh, i, I should have brought this up later in the conversation i'm gonna get on a fucking tangent that <laughs> no, place was absolutely. so sick that was i mean this is when we were so i was kind of a mall rat because i was obsessed with and still am this game called dance dance revolution <laughs> <laughs> and uh okay. so my teenage years we would just go to the mall play this game and then when we ran out of money we would just go to every store and just look at stuff like we couldn't afford anything but like suncoast we'd just go flip through stuff kind of like put stuff in the back of our head like oh that looks cool um 
Yeah, and then there was like a bookstore in there too. So we would we would hop between like Suncoast, Sam Goody, and this bookstore. And then Hot Topic too. But like Hot Topic came later. Suncoast was like right. yeah. And um I guess uh Babbage's, which is I guess GameStop now. It was a, the oh, the video really? game store. That yeah. name sounds familiar. Shit, Babbage's, I don't know if I remember yeah. that or not, but it sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Damn. That's insane. Yeah. I, I. I. Like. Like I say, you know, as far as like movies, a little bit later, touching on some of that stuff. But uh, you know, uh, talking some of these like Midwest stores, that was always one that I still miss today. Is St- Suncoast? They always had yeah. some cool stuff, dude. Like it was just kind of one of those spots where like not even ironically did they have a bunch of crap that it was like any of the normal people going in there were, you know, looking at like trauma movies or some of this oh, like yeah. sh- real schlocky shit. And like, yeah. what is this? And me and my buddy <laughs> were like, this is it. <laughs> yeah. And they would have like um, memorabilia and stuff too. Like it was yeah, like, yeah. Or like, you know, what the equivalent to like Funko pops are now, you know, mm-hmm. they would have, they would have that stuff. And yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Very, it's very like, cool. It's just kind of sad that like everything has been, uh, like all those specialty stores are basically replaced by like, you know, Target or Walmart. Mm-hmm. You can buy like a leather face figurine from fucking Target now, you know, like where it was. It, it, uh, yeah. It is insane how much like different things like that, where you just going through like a, going through a Walmart or going through a Target and looking at different like spots. Like you mentioned, like a leather face figure, some like, you know, the other day I was looking and there's like this two pack of like a Godzilla versus King Kong, like big special, like, I don't know. It just looked like something you'd have to like pre-order and wait years. Yeah. For, you know? I'm like, how the hell do they have this? Like, yeah, yeah so that's, that's pretty insane. I, I, I agree. Uh, I just... and it, it is, it is sad that, you know, some of like the smaller, like mom and pop things, uh, you know, are, are, are gone, uh, you know, but I guess there's like a FYE still, which still kind of feels like a, bigger franchise type thing you know like shut yeah. down your throat but yeah. yeah well yeah that's that's the weird part is that i have nostalgia for uh places that are still like big box chains but like they're just all gone like it's just like amazon yeah, right. or walmart or target like <laughs> <laughs> it's just so, weird <laughs> so so within these these uh you know these first years and these first shows and concerts and different things what about a local venue uh you know is there anything that comes to mind as far as when you first started playing in uh you know maybe these first couple of bands a, a local venue uh that you guys played and does do any of these places still exist uh either peoria or you know when you first moved to to denver there yeah um so yeah the fir- the major place for hardcore and metalcore shows which back then we just everyone called it just hardcore it was everything was hardcore mm-hmm. uh we would go the east peoria legion hall which just sounds oh, okay. like nondescript and generic but that is that's a <laughs> fucking legendary place like anyone from central illinois that grew up during that time has seen a show there like okay. that's where i saw all like pretty much everything there was, I mean, we didn't really have venues. That was the thing is like, I saw Mudvayne at the Madison theater, but then like that closed down shortly after that. And that's kind of like a medium capacity venue. I, I don't, I'm really bad at capacities, but I would say like that, that place probably had like uh, a couple thousand capacity. Mm-hmm. And then I forgot to mention the one of the bigger shows that I saw when I was uh, 14 was I saw Slayer and Slipknot at a, uh, this place called the East Peoria Legion or not East Peoria Legion, East Peoria Convention Center. And that was like a big venue, but I don't know. Peoria has always had a problem Sheesh. with keeping a uh, bigger, there's a, there's a place in Peoria called the civic center that still does shows, but that's like an arena. That's like, you know, all uh, oh, right. Okay. Like, yeah, I can't even think of who would play there, but like that's where they had the gathering of the juggalos in uh two thousand one. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's big. It's a big place. So like for underground shows, it was it was only we didn't you know, when I moved to Denver we have we have like tons of venues and like people kind of complain here, which is hilarious to me because it's like you're in a big city, like maybe this didn't used to be a big city, but it certainly is by my metrics, like we uh, you know in peoria everybody had to form their own scene so like the shows were at legion halls or vfw halls or literally the basement of a church or you know Mm -hmm. 
some you know some kids finally got some money together and rent out a space for a year and there was a venue there that they like built a stage at or uh a kid from Peoria's dad his dad owned a roller rink and they would have shows there uh so yeah i mean all of those places are no no longer there <laughs> damn that yeah. sucks uh, now have you been back to like uh the the Peoria area since moving Oh, absolutely. Yeah, my my oh, okay. family's from there. Uh, I'm about to go there in a couple of weeks, actually. Oh, sick. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they're still doing shows there, then? They have the, that venue still up and everything? No, no. That venue <clears throat> that venue stopped doing shows even when I was still living in Peoria. So it would have been oh, like... Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the heyday for that stuff was like early 2000s um, for the, the specifically the East Peoria Legion Hall. Um uh i don't that's the problem is there's not th there's always been a venue issue in central illinois so the scene never thrives because it's there's no you know no and that's the thing too is that the east peoria legion hall it costs 500 dollars to rent out it was no means cheap you know i we did shows there and i don't know how <laughs> but it's like if somebody <laughs> Somebody asked me to do a show for them now. I'm like, I'm not spending a dime of my own money to do this. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it, it's just, I mean, like, I don't understand. Like, cause like, yeah, we, I guess maybe too, is that the shows were more well attended. Like one of the biggest shows I saw, which happened to be my first hardcore, like actual hardcore show was, it was a tour package. There wasn't any locals on it, but it was like terror, remembering never, uh, the Warriors and I think the Acacia Strain all on the Whoa. same show. And Where was yeah, this? East Peoria Legion Hall. And Holy Peoria. Moly. East Peoria. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, had, that had to have been 2004 because I was a freshman. Um, I should tell the story how I found Dang. out about this scene. Uh, so yeah go for it because <laughs> uh, it's this shit's kind of hard to find like like i said when once the once the you know the walls are broken down then it's like oh yeah easy but back mm -hmm. then like there was staunchly like a separate scene there was like the new metal stuff and then there was the the, the hardcore like metalcore stuff and that they intentionally didn't want any of the fucking push pit new metal kids at their you know hardcore shows so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the scenes were separated, but I don't know who it was, but I like somebody had the idea to flyer for a um, uh, black Dahlia murder was supposed to play off their first album. This was in 2004. So somebody had flyered for this show at one of the stupid new metal shows that I went to, like me and my friends would go to all these dumb shows and we like hated every second of it. It was like, it was like fuel to create our own sound because, like, Do this is else, yeah. yeah, this is before <laughs> this is before we knew that the scene existed. So we were just like, we would literally go to the show, sit out on the curb, and just be like, "This sucks." Like, there's got to be something better. <laughs> like, maybe we just need to do our own thing. Like, this is before knowing what DIY was or anything. But somebody had flyered for this Black Dollar Murder show, and at this stupid new metal show we were at and we were sitting outside cause like the band sucked and they were like, Hey, like come to this. And we we're like, Oh, we, we know, we knew who black Dahlia was. And we were like, Oh fuck. Yeah. Like we're stoked. But the, the, the most, I don't even know how my life would be without this little tidbit, but there was, um, Peoria scene dot TK at the bottom. And it was a link to the, the message board, the hardcore message. Oh, board. Sure. Okay. And then yeah. it was just, the fucking world had opened up to me. And so, <laughs> you know, I like log in and I see these listings for the shows and it's like, Oh, walls of Jericho just played here last week. Like every band that I had found out about on headbangers ball had played Peoria or was about to play Peoria. And it was just like, I mean, we, w so we went sick. into the, yeah, we went into that Legion hall for the first show. And there was like, there was like double the amount of people at this like new metal show that happened the week mm -hmm. prior or whatever. So it was just like, it truly was underground. I mean, like I said, like these shows would be getting like 500 people without a promoter or a real venue to play at, you know, like it's just like unheard of for now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, it's, it's so sick, you know, like when you're initially 
seeing those things and, and kind of trying to process it in your mind, you know, whether may you be young or maybe you be old and think of like, well, how the fuck are they pulling this off? Like who are the ones that are actually putting these shows on and are they buying a PA? Is it somebody that they know that has one? And it's like, maybe I need to try and be buddies with that dude so he can like help yeah. out a couple of different people, you know, and put on yeah. something else. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what a, 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 a uh, you know, finding that like DIY moment and, you know, kind of trying to, you know, do what you can to, to, to make shit just lift off and, and have fun and be able to get bands in town and shit like that. Like it's certainly, you know, kind of is, is totally invigorating. I, I love that with, with, you know, touching on that, as far as yourself getting into playing, uh, how does that come about? Cause I know, you know, you play drums, you play guitar, bass. Uh, what was that initial instrument that came to you and, and how were you introduced into playing? Yeah, so actually, this is probably a surprise for most people, but my my first instrument was violin in uh, oh okay fourth grade. Uh, okay, and I played that all the way through high school. So I don't know Dang. nine years or so. So, um, I don't know. I think my so I think it was my dad's idea. He was, he bought me a guitar for my. Uh, it was in seventh grade for Christmas. So then I started playing guitar and obviously like, I don't know, I guess something I'd picked up from learning violin, it kind of just like, I could, I could um, piece together music by hearing it, like, you know, play by ear, I guess. And uh, so like, I didn't know how to play guitar, but I could still like figure riffs out, you know, and I still really don't know how to play guitar. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, like, all I right, <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I just know like power chords. I know like literally the three chords I was taught in, uh, <laughs> in lessons. Uh, yeah. I tried taking guitar lessons and it just kind of sucked. Like I think my, my first teacher just kind of was weird. And like, it was just like this weird guy with like, I, I don't know he like he you, you know how like you're supposed to keep your nails short for like your your uh you're a drummer so you probably i don't know they tell you <laughs> they tell you to keep your nails short for the hand that is pressing the frets so that you know your nails don't get stuck on that or whatever oh, but this okay. dude this dude had his like picking hand he had like some freakishly long nails but his no his other <laughs> hand was normal like they were clipped and i was like this is this is a weird person like so and like and that's the thing is like i got into guitar because i wanted to like learn nirvana and stuff like you know stuff like yeah. that and he was like just trying to teach me basics and i don't know the lessons were not for me <laughs> Did you, so did you have through that? Cause I, I guess that's a, that's an interesting, you know, thing as far as with doing some of these and some people having, you know, positive experience with lessons and others having a negative, was there, were there friends, were there family members, somebody that was really pushing you through as far as like, well, go, you know, don't give up on it. Maybe this was a bad experience. You know, did you end up getting different lessons that kind of, you know, push you into like, you know, a, a better situation or what pushed you to continue after that, that negative experience? Um, you it wasn't that I wanted to quit the instrument. That's the thing is I like, <laughs> I wanted, and I probably did already have all these bands formed before I even like knew how to really <laughs> oh. fucking play. So yeah, yeah that, okay. that, was, that was always the impetus. It was like, we're going to play live music. I don't care if we don't know how to do it. So, okay. um, and that's actually to answer the second part of the question. That's how I started playing bass because our first band originally was like three people that played guitar. So like, it was literally like three guitarists. That's it. Um, this hmm. is when I was like 12 or 13. Um, so then I was kind of just like, all right, well I'll get a bass. And then our other friend who I still live with to today and who plays in cadaver dog and everything, like we've known each other since we were like six years old, he got okay. a drum set. Um, so from there there was we actually had you know we had two people playing guitar i'm doing bass which is it as far as i'm concerned guitar without hitting the power chord yeah right <laughs> um <laughs> which changed later i finally learned how to play bass sort of for real later on but at the time it was three you know two guitarists bass playing the same thing and then the drummer and then 
I would do vocals because, uh, again, it was just uh, somebody needed to do it. I wasn't, we weren't going to wait to find somebody to do it. Um, yeah, and then that band, that band was called Sick, which was uh, my middle school band. It was spelled S I C, like the Slipknot song. Slipknot uh, track. Oh, absolutely. Man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't sound anything like Slipknot. It wasn't even new metal. It was like this, it was just like weird heavy stuff but we didn't know how to do it so it did it did sound unique even though it was bad um (laughs) but um i don't even remember what you're saying about the shows but yeah we so immediately we started doing our own shows like my friend uh josh um his mom was like oh you guys can you guys can throw a show in our uh his basement so like seventh eighth grade I remember writing and I don't know why we did this, but we, we read out, we like wrote the flyer directions for the show handwritten. We didn't make photocopies. We literally wrote out like 50 copies or whatever and handed them out to kids at our school. And then uh, after school, a bunch of kids walked over to the show and yeah, we just played this show and it was terrible. Like <laughs> but kids were like there and excited. So, I mean, it made us feel cool. Damn. Everything handwritten. That's uh, was that just out of like not knowing a, a, like a copier around or like not even knowing that I, that was like an option. I guess that not even thinking it was an option. We, Cause like, I remember we also did this some for, work. Yeah, we did it for our website, too, because that was the funny thing is we had, like, a website. I had, like, built a website on, like, GeoCities or whatever, Mm. and uh, I bought a domain. This was, like, 2003 or something. But, yeah, we would write out the handwritten address for the website and hand them out to kids at school. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. That's awesome. This, and we didn't uh, have any music. I mean, I think we eventually recorded later, but um again, it was still it would still have just have been like a burnt C D or something like that. Okay. Okay. W- with within first taking on guitar, uh do you remember, you know, like maybe the first like album or song that you really sat down and wanted to learn and you know, took a minute to to kinda, you know, uh for the most part learn it or learn it all the way through what what uh, what comes to mind there? Yeah, so for me, it was, like, uh, instantly Nirvana. Like, I just wanted to learn everything, all their songs. Um, Again, with the lessons, I, like... I So, to answer the the question before, I did end up taking lessons with another guy for, like, just a very small amount of time. Because he was in a band, and he got, like... His, it started picking up and he had to go on tour. So he's like, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. But he was actually really cool. Um, he, instead of being like, we're going to work out of this like workbook, he was like, what do you want to learn? Like, what songs do you like? Uh, so at that point, I'd already learned a lot of Nirvana songs by uh, reading tabs online. I don't, I can't even remember. There's like websites. Uh, I'm sure they're still around, some of them. Mm-hmm. But it was like tabs and uh i learned how to so that's the the irony is i know how to read music but i guess only for violin yeah (laughs) so so i never i never translated it to guitar so i I still to this day just know tabs or if somebody makes a video i can learn it or i mean i've always been pretty good at learning by ear um Mm. so that's how i learned all the nirvana stuff uh but my the guy that i was taking lessons from he showed me drop d i didn't know because i was reading these tabs and like they don't really explain they just kind of they just kind of assume that you know what uh different tunings are so like Mm -hmm. for the song heart shaped box it was in drop d and i remember playing it to the tab and i'm like this doesn't sound right but like i guess i mean they said it's you know the internet's always right, right? Like the tab is like, so then this, that, I think that's why I'm bringing it up. Cause like the guy br- introducing me to drop D in different tunings is like revolutionary because I mean, everyone hates drop D now. I, I don't know. I feel like I write all of my music in drop D like uh, my band. And right after high school, that was in drop D. I have like a black metal project. That's all in drop D. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I, I, and I think it's from that moment he showed me and it kind of, it made the sound like heart shaped box sound incorrect. And him showing me the drop D it like immediately, like something clicked. And like, I think I have really bad dexterity in my hands and playing in drop D has always made more sense to me. So, oh, okay. um, but none of the punk bands I'm in play in drop D. <laughs> so, cause it, I'm gonna, I don't know. Adjust here. <laughs> yeah, the, it sound. I don't know. It makes sense. Like drop D is not really like it's like a heavier tuning, you know. Like, mm. uh, it's got that like chunkier sound to it. So, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. It doesn't really work for like you know fast music. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> with, with so you know continuing on you know with uh with with earlier experiences in in music you know we talked about uh you know so you mentioned your first band being a, a sick and, and playing shows and different things like that. What about recording? What was the first time that you you recorded? Was it fun? Was it a stressful experience? Uh, did it end up sounding like how you imagined? What was the first recording that you got back? Yeah. So again, like we we did all of our recordings ourselves because I don't, I don't know. Like I can't, I can't like, I can't be like Ian Mackay told me to do DIY and like, this is how it was. It was just, it was all it was the really, option that was there. It was all really innate. It was just like, okay, we have these computers with microphones. Like, you know, the, there used to be like microphones that would sit on a desk, uh, that had like a little stand on it. Yeah, yeah. So we would just like press record on, uh, I think it was literally just like windows, uh, whatever built in recorder they had, uh, which is not an audio software program at all. <laughs> right. It's literally just like a feature that happened to be in the, the, the computer. So we would just like press play on that and then run over to our instruments and just like play the song. And then, press stop and then that was it it was like okay this is the recording um okay so that was that was pretty much the experience for the first few bands and then mm -hmm. um one of my stupid punk bands in high school we actually went over to some guy's house and recorded he had like a home studio or something and uh it just didn't work the same like we we played everything track by track and i just remember like when we finally got it back we we're like this sucks like it doesn't sound like a band <laughs> playing together um, oh no uh so that you know that kind of always like tainted me on the real experience even though at the time this was just like another kid who just happened to have like pro tools or something so yeah but okay. uh, i mean to this day it's kind of always been I wouldn't say DIY, but definitely still punk. Like, I don't think I've ever um, really, really recorded in like a real place. Like we've gone and done stuff at Will Killingsworth's house, but again, it's just his house. Like mm. he's just built this, you know, I mean, it is as legit as it can be. Like, it's great. Right. It, he knows what he's doing. He's built rooms that, um, you know, have no bleed between the tracks and whatnot, but Mm. Uh, I guess the, the closest thing to a real studio is culture shock went in, um, to record at this one place. Cause we, we heard they were kind of the only place in town that had like a full analog reel to reel. And we wanted to do that. So that album was recorded oh, in a real, uh, a real studio. But the only reason yeah. we got in there is cause like we knew somebody like that knew the, the, the head, uh, engineer. So, mm. So, but and that was even kind of weird. I mean, I liked it, but at the same time, it was just like, there was like, there was like an unease being there. I don't know. <laughs> like, like an unwelcome or what? what no, as it, far as... it's more just like, I'm just so used to being at like a friend's basement or oh, something. Okay. Whereas okay. like this felt like, especially at the beginning, we're like, the more we're fucking up, the more that we're like wasting time, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. that kind of just gets in your head. Cause yeah. we did that. We did all that stuff live and uh, you know, so one person messed up, we all had to do it again. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about traveling out of state or, you know, like doing a run of some shows with a, with a band, you know, was, was it a positive or negative experience? Did anything go wrong, you know, while traveling in between, uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So 
My fur, okay, which would have been right after or right when I started college. So this was like 2008. We started this band called Maltross. It's um, it was kind of like a punk version of like a stoner band. Uh, mm. We were like instrumental, but uh, yeah, it was kind of it's it had like I don't know, it, it like heavily influenced by like Black Sabbath and Sleep, but with like punk DIY ethics and mentality. So, sure. Uh, I'm trying to think. So it was the summer of 2009 and I, I, there was like a, there was like a point we had played this festival and it was done by people locally. And at this point, you know, I was very much just like pretty much in Peoria, you know, playing shows in Peoria, going to shows in Peoria, but there was a few bands in the scene that were starting to tour. Um, but they were older than us. They were like a few, probably like three years older than us. And I was like, that's cool. I mean, that's something we'll do eventually. You know, I was like 19 or 18 or something like that. But then we played this fest and there was like these, a bunch of bands from Chicago had come down and it was just like, there was like a neck, there was like kind of a next level. Like I was like really impressed. Um, uh, Chris, de benedetto from parisia he's he's one of my oh, friends okay. to the day to this day um but i remember seeing his band and uh just blown away it, they were like a screamo band but they were from chicago and like you know like i always say like i'm from the middle of nowhere we didn't have anybody telling us what was cool <laughs> so we were like <laughs> We were probably, I mean, they probably thought we were all like, you know, five years behind what was going on up there. Cause like Chicago had, you know, every band that went on tour would tour through there. So like, you know, they were seeing like obscure bands from Europe, like way before I even knew who they were. Um, <laughs> but the thing that really clicked was um, when I finally realized, like I went and up to talk to them afterwards and they had a seven inch, like that was their seven inch, like sort of, it was like a pre-release. It hadn't officially come out yet, but they had it on the table and I was like, Oh, cool. Um, you know, like, how'd you do this? Who put this out? And they're like, we did. And then I was like, well, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's like always awkward asking people their age, but I was like, well, how old are you guys? And he was like, I'm 18 or 19. And so something, Dang. something in that moment clicked where I was just like, okay, why aren't we doing this? Like, we need to step it up. Like, if they can do it, yeah. why can't we? Like, you know, what's holding us back? Um, so then, like, right, right then and there is like, I, we like booked this like week tour, um, which was in August of 2009. And it was a fucking, it was terrible. It was a complete failure. Oh no. Oh no. We, uh, it, do you, okay. <laughs> do you remember the website, uh, do DIY.org? I don't think so. No. Okay. It's just this, it was a website that would, uh, basically list like DIY venues across the U S and I guess they had stuff in Europe and other countries too. But mm. so we used this website to book a week tour, a Midwest tour. And this was the first time I'd ever been out of state without my parents. This is the first time I had ever played a show out of state. This is the first time I'd ever attended a show out of state. Cause I think at this point I'd had gone to shows up in Chicago or St. Louis, which is Peoria is about halfway between those two cities. Um, so yeah, it was a fucking, it was a nightmare. It was like, <laughs> we, uh, we played with cool bands. Like we really did discover some really good music, but like there's just so many things that happened outside of the shows. Like my friend, uh, that was a, we were touring in two different vehicles. We didn't have a way to get around. I was in my, tr my truck and we put all of our amps and gear in the flatbed of the truck. And then my friend oh, was driving a car so we had two vehicles and like gas guzzler manual transmission truck. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That are, we were just forced it to work. Like we like literally didn't yeah. know what we we're doing. And then we like booked all these shows from do DIY.org and some of them were good, but uh, my friend got in my friend driving the other car who was in the band got in a wreck the first night in Milwaukee. Um, uh, 
we like lost a camera my truck ended up breaking down in the middle of indiana and then we had to like basically my parents had to like go and pick it up the next week when i like school started the next week for me like in college so like i couldn't even go to pick it up like uh but we did play uh, i was gonna say we played lansing michigan which is that's kind of up there right it's like a little south of uh yeah, like southeast yeah okay yeah. yeah where was that at do you remember do you remember the spot oh man no it was uh you're, you're a man of memory that's why i asked john i've listened to some of your interviews and i'm like how the fuck do you remember <laughs> these things <laughs> uh, yeah i guess i do have a good i mean i can remember the other shows like we played i mean i don't know who's going to be listening to this but i'll name some of the venue like we played this place called the boardward in Mil- milwaukee that's okay. legendary. Uh, it's no longer around. We played this place in Quad Cities. Uh, it was like a record store. I don't remember the name. But then in Chicago, we played Albion House, which is like, as far as I know, still a place okay. that does shows. Uh, mm-hmm. They had done shows for years, even by the time we played there. Mm-hmm. I can't remember okay. the place in Lansing. It was literally a hodgepodge. That show was bad. Uh, <laughs> oh boy! Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really ever recall there being like a huge. I know like Kalamazoo had a really big hardcore and punk yeah, uh, scene for a long time. Yeah, uh, we wanted Grand to Rapids play Kalamazoo. Been, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about Lansing though. I've, I've seen shows at the Loft. I don't know if you ever heard of that spot. Um, that no. was okay, but I mean that, that was like a little bit bigger show. As it wasn't about yeah. like a house show or anything like that, but. Yeah. Um, uh, that's funny. What What about as far as, you know, from early on to even more recently, uh, like if, if you have any sort of a, a ritual, you know, like pre-show, if you have anything that kind of centers you before playing or, uh, you know, as far as practicing, uh, do you have anything that you do, you know, kind of just before you're about to go on to play? Um, not really. I mean, I feel like now I have like, ever since shows have come back from the pandemic, I do kind of have like um, thought about things that uh, I guess I just neglected this. Cause like most, of, okay. Most of the time when I would play shows, it would be like, I enjoy every single band here. I, you know, I don't even care about playing. I'm more excited to see the other bands that, if that has to do with how things are out here or just like a cultural shift or me just getting older but now Mm. for sure like i mean even if it is a band i like i kind of like to give myself some time to warm up my wrists um just play the guitar a bit to make sure it's not going to go out of tune uh i bring a fucking towel to shows now like I mean, it's lame, but it's, like, things I probably should have been doing forever ago. Because, uh, like, <laughs> yeah. after you're done playing, it's, like, you, you're you just, like, drenched in sweat. And, like, if you're not playing, if you're not the last band, then, like, you're just uncomfortable for the rest of the night, you know. Yeah. It would be, it, it's lame to bring a towel, but it's even more lame to bring, like, moisture-wicking shirts instead, <laughs> you know. Like, so, I mean, I can deal, I can deal with the black towel, you know. <laughs> oh man that, that's funny I, and i i agree I, you know it is one of those things where it's like it kind of settles on you you know getting a little bit older and you're like man you know like i don't want to use that as an excuse but also maybe some of these things i should have had in a routine a little bit you know beforehand yeah. just as far as getting in the third or fourth song you're like oof, i'm kind of fucking winded already <laughs> yeah i know i think yeah i don't i should have been doing this a while ago like warming up is totally a thing that you have to do f- for anything physical it doesn't matter how old you are that's like why why they make yeah. you do stretches and calisthenics before you go play a basketball game or a football game um mm. and i think honestly i instead of it being age i think it's more so that i like got back into this hobby i have ddr which totally you have to warm up. Like you can't just jump into it. You have to stretch. You have to like get used to it. So uh, playing the instrument before you touch it for the first time on stage is not a good idea, you know, like, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, as far as from going, you know, uh, as to, to Peoria, uh, 2014, was it that you moved to, Den- to Denver? Yeah. 2014, May, 2014. Okay. Oh, All right. I guess, he, yeah, June. June. It would be like June. 
Okay. All right. You, you had mentioned uh, in another interview, as far as, you know, some bands, um, you know, being the reason that you'd move there. And uh, what can you tell us as far as, you know, like discovering this, the scene and some of the bands, you know, that really inspired uh, your move as far as uh, heading out less there? Yeah. Uh, so like I can pinpoint the reason, like at least musically why I moved here is from, so I had booked a show in, I, so I grew up in Peoria, but then I moved to Champaign-Urbana for college. So I spent about six years there um, before moving to Denver. So I, in Peoria, I was still a kid. I was sort of like um, a, a passive member of the scene. You know, I had my silly bands that people would book, but we really didn't, we did, we did do our own shows, but I wasn't, we weren't like carrying the torch for the scene. In fact, like the shows we did were like not as cool as like what was happening peripherally. But when I moved to Champaign, there was a scene there, but it was, it was different. Um, there were like ska bands. And at this point, you know, I was like, by the time I had moved to Champaign, I was like full fledged nose deep into the underground music. You know, I was like, into gore grind and black metal and noise <laughs> and everything. So I just kind of, when I moved to Champaign, I was like, seriously, like you guys are still doing like your ska punk thing. Like <laughs> I was like really, really not impressed with the scene. Um, <laughs> so there was like a few years of just kind of going to shows and kind of hating it and, you know, thinking, it's pretty smugly that like Peoria was so much better and uh, oh really wow. sort of like nostalgic for those shows, but mm -hmm. you know coincidentally, Peoria had that was the point where a lot of people were moving out of Peoria. It wasn't just me; there were like major players in the scene that were moving out west, so the shows kind of started to dissolve entirely. So at that point there was really nothing, you know, I can't, I couldn't just be like, Oh, Peoria is better. I can just go back and watch these bands in Peoria. Um, yeah, okay. there, that started to fizzle. So then I think it was just, there was like a group of us. There was like, I don't know. I think I just met a bunch of like-minded people that were in the scene that were doing stuff. Um, they were trying to do stuff. And I think we just kind of all banded together and we're like, we have to do something like we have to make something happen. So we started booking our own shows as much as we could when we were old enough to like get our own place. Like, cause I lived in the dorms at school for the first couple of years. We like got our own place, started doing shows, started meeting people. And honestly, I had this naive thing. Like I had this, like uh, I just thought college was going to be this like, amazing place where like everyone there was like intellectual and like into really obscure music and you know <laughs> watched like art films and stuff and like come to find out i mean everyone there was just as normal as can be you know like col <laughs> college didn't separate like everyone from my generation went to college so it wasn't like it was the same people from high school that like you know, I don't, I just don't understand where I thought like, Oh, all of a sudden someone's going to be like into drone music that lives in my dorm or something. Like, yeah. It was, yeah. it is okay. really stupid. But so most of the cool, <laughs> <laughs> most of the coolest people I met in Champaign were, uh, counties. They were people that didn't even go to the school. So those were the kids oh, that okay. were doing shows and, starting bands and you know doing doing stuff so like once i hooked up with them we you know we started they started doing shows we started doing shows and it's weird because like i feel like i was uh heavily con contributing to the scene in a way that i was never able to do in peoria like the bands we were booking influenced what people were into and i like the best way i can describe it and especially to anybody that may be feeling like they're like stuck in a cornfield themselves where there's no culture like you just have to do it yourself like you if you want to see a band that you like you have to bring them there and maybe the first show there will be nobody there but eventually you can persuade people to get into this stuff mm -hmm. as long as you just keep doing it like 
And, you know, you can't expect everyone to be like down the same rabbit holes as you. So like th the fact that you can bring music in, they can see it and respond to it and get into it. I mean, like that's the best way to build a culture. Like if, if it doesn't exist, you have to like curate it yourself. Like if there's no curation, if it's just a bunch of, you know, the Lansing Michigan show where it was literally a hodgepodge of bands uh, because somebody like responded to our email on do DIY.org. Like it's, that's not how you build culture. Like you, there has to be somebody curating it. Otherwise people are only going to show up to play the show and then they're not going to watch any other bands. It's basically a battle of the yeah. bands every show. So um, long story short, I booked um, some bands from Denver. I had booked, uh, there was a tour that was posted on a message board called Viva La Vinyl back in the day. I think it still exists, but okay. uh, VLV. But um, they had posted the tour dates and it was this band Salvation from, you know, Youth Attack. And because uh, at this point I had found Youth Attack, I don't even remember when, 2008, 2007 there was like there was a scene bubbling up that had started around 2006 2007 and it was prior to that hardcore to me was uh beat down basketball shorts beating the shit out yeah. of each other because that was the bands that were booked in peoria like uh i remember i saw this band called death star uh yeah x okay. bishop x like stuff like that which like <laughs> whatever if you're into that like sure i could probably be into that now but at the time i was like hardcore not really my thing no one like gave me a negative approach record or no one told me to listen to anything cool so it took a, a while to get there but i found these bands through this emerging scene that was sounding more like 80s hardcore and right. uh youth attack was kind of putting out in my opinion the best version of that so right. um fast forward to 2012 I had saw that Salvation was going on tour and they were bringing uh, Civilized and Cadaver Dog and Negative Degree from Denver. Those three bands were playing like a string of shows with them because there was a big fest in Indianapolis that they were all playing. Um, and I saw that they posted they were going to play Carbondale at this place called the Lost Cross House, which has been around forever. But I was like, I somehow convinced uh, Mark Masters, who's in negative degree, that um, they should come play in Urbana, which is uh, where we were doing shows in our house. And it was like a new house that we had never done a show before in. We had just moved in like the month before. But... Um, they, I think, I don't remember. I think now that I know like everyone else in the bands and stuff, uh, they, uh, I think they were all hesitant to come to Champagne because, like, at the time, no one knew where what it was. Like, it, uh, bands would tour and play St. Louis or Chicago, uh, but no one had heard of like Champagne Urbana. And so I, like, I think I just said, like, yeah, like, please come, like, it's gonna be sick. And, so it was like those four bands. And then immediately I was like, we got to make a band. Like, this is our chance to like, you know, play this show. Like, I don't, I couldn't think of it. There wasn't really any like hardcore bands in town at the time. There was like some bands doing like a screamo thing. And uh, yeah, there was, there just wasn't a band that would fit like super well. So I was just like, okay, we're going to make this band. And then, so we just like made this, uh, started writing riffs like right away. And then we played the show and surprisingly they didn't think it sucked. And so we kind of like we, kinda like, we all hit it off and that's how I met all the, the Denver guys. And that's how I met the guys from salvation. So oh, shit. Okay. by the time uh, I decided I wanted to move somewhere, I, you know, I had already known all these people out here. So I was like, yeah, like I kind of didn't want to move to Chicago because that's what everyone in the Midwest does. So, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to have something, uh, you know, I, I wanted to move to a bigger city cause I, the job opportunities and all that, but yeah. So sure. then I, I picked Denver and, you know, some of my friends from, uh, from my hometown came with me and yeah, ever since we've been here, same house. Too. Oh, okay. Damn. Okay. That, I mean, that's, and it's one of those things, you know, where like even Denver or like Boulder, uh, for whatever reason, for the longest, like I, I know I have like friends and family that are out west there. 
uh, and mentioned, you know, like shows for the longest were few and far between because it was like really difficult, you know, as far as just geographically trying to figure out, you know, where to go from or where to go to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's like a really, you know, thriving. I, I don't know if it's the last five or 10 years, but like yeah. Denver's like almost like one of those spots to be now. All of a sudden. For sure. Sick. For sure. It's rad. I think, yeah. I mean, I can speak on that since I moved here kind of when uh, it started to become like uh, a place that people wanted to live, not just like musically, but just like, it started to become a destination because like weed was legalized in 2014. So when, oh, I, yeah. when I first moved here, um, I'm used to Midwest where like every band that went on tour, especially in the underground punk circuit, like they would play the West coast or they play the East coast mm. or they do the Midwest. And we, we got to see if, if I wanted to go see a band I really liked, I'd most likely had to drive to Chicago, but I would be able to see that band. So mm. I was like, not, used to looking at flyers and seeing a date that I couldn't go to so that when, <laughs> when I moved to Denver, it was like, not only were like bigger bands sort of skipping it, but the DIY bands were for sure skipping it. Because if you were doing, um, if you were doing a full U S tour, you're going to go on the periphery of the United States. Like I, I honestly think like Billings, Montana has more shows than Denver Back back in 2014. <laughs> the fuck is going on in Montana? <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense because, like, if you're going, no one really does full U.S.s anymore. But like, you would go yeah. up and down the East Coast. You would go through like Texas. You'd go up the West mm-hmm. Coast, and then to get to like Chicago or Minneapolis, you would go through like Idaho, Montana. So like mm-hmm. Denver and Oklahoma, oh, and like. Okay. I don't know, even probably Salt Lake had more shows because Salt Lake kind of is the West Coast. You can play like Las Vegas and hit Salt Lake and then kind of cut back to, you know, the Pacific Northwest. But for Denver, I mean, honestly, the first couple of years I lived here, it was like we were just like trying to get bands to come out here, like play Kansas City and then drive another eight hours to get here. Um, (laughs) And yeah, like... uh, it, that's the thing is like it's really on a it's like on an island like it's it's eight hours away from the next like destination and like yeah in the midwest you can even play smaller college towns and even cut your drives in even further but most of the time it's no longer than like five hours to get to places in the midwest whereas like there's like literally that like from here to uh uh omaha there's literally nowhere else to play like so (laughs) it's a stretch to get people to come out here you know but now you're right it it is it's people will people will plan their tours to come out to here it's it's kind of crazy um yeah and sick i mean it's such a cool thing you know like there's i think there was something i was just looking at today uh fuck i can't remember what the flyer was but there weren't they weren't even stopping in in michigan at all but i saw that there was boulder and there was denver i'm like Wow. What, what is happening? Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> wild. It's sick. You know, that, that's awesome. I mean, it's cool to, you know, to see the opportunity of, of uh, you know, just a, a variation of, you know, spots and, and different things, you know, kind of having a spotlight. And, uh, you know, uh, there's different bands popping up even on, in Ohio right now as far as, like, the hardcore scene that they're having a bunch of shit popping. And it's a bunch of really cool young bands that are, you know, just, like, all of a sudden popping up. It's just like – where is this coming from? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I appreciate it. You don't know what geographically, uh, wherever it is, you know, whatever. I, I, I do appreciate seeing that too. So that's, yeah. that's sick. And especially, you know, making the move, uh, you know, from there to, you know, make it a big jump and uh, it paying off, you know, thank God uh, in, in, in certain aspects. Uh, that's, that's gotta be a good feeling too. And not having it be in something where you're like, Oh, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it's, it was like, I I think I had moved here and then my friend James was like, all right, you're in like basically every band that I'm doing like mm. right off the bat. So, and I didn't yeah. expect that. I just thought I could move out here and um, I just didn't want to go back to, I had, I gotten used to being somebody that was contributing to things in Champagne, and I didn't want to move to Chicago and just become a show goer again So I wanted to move here because at the time uh, there was, there was plenty of opportunity to put on shows, be in bands, et cetera. And Mm -hmm. uh, that was my goal. It's like, I'll just move out there and 
find my little niche but then like immediately i was like in five bands so <laughs> <laughs> yeah Sick. that rules all right, all right so uh if you don't mind really quick, I'm going to pause this. I'm actually, I'm going to end this session because uh, we're over an hour and it starts uh, ticking at me as far as that it's going to try to cut us off. Oh. Uh, I'm going to save this really quick and then pop right back on. I just okay. have, uh, we're going to go over these, uh, the, the, some, of, some of these current bands that you're in right now, a little bit of horror, and then uh, wrap it up if you're good with that, man. Cool, yeah, I'm, I'm good. So. All right, all right, sweet. Just a minute here. Okay. <laughs> right. Yo, what's up? So, uh, my my phone died. So thank oh, God really? that thank God that I wrapped that up uh, because otherwise this shit would have all been deleted. Oh, God. <laughs> I would have been very bummed and, and embarrassed. So uh, thank thank God. I, I I don't know what it was that uh, all of a sudden because normally like I've been I, this is I, I'm probably just around like two or three hundred now of doing uh these interviews and uh, i for the longest haven't had to like stop them you know at first i had to because it would give us like a timer after like an hour and then oh, all of yeah. a sudden it like started saying that it was it was giving me like a, a rundown and uh yeah i'm glad that it did because uh, i my phone would have died otherwise i wouldn't even notice so all right anyway um okay so we were you know, we were touching on you you move into denver uh kind of that 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 scene over there uh and then you know kind of from here, I wanted to dig into a couple of your bands uh you know that that have some some things going on right now some some music you know that you've been playing with a live or recording in the last few years here, touching on the following acts uh you know I just kind of wanted to you know maybe bring up some things as far as like the foundation of the sound when you guys were initially. Uh, you know, uh, writing music or, or kind of talking about the idea behind the aesthetic of the band, um, early memories of riffs or, or tracks, uh, you know, starting off with Cadaver Dog. So you mentioned uh, meeting those guys and playing a show with them early on. Uh, how did you end up getting to be a, a member of the band? Um, yeah, I mean, I think. So when I first moved here, Cadaver Dog was pretty much over as far as like playing live shows. Um so yeah, it's Cadaver Dog is a solo. It's essentially it's a solo project. It's a James Trejo's solo project. Uh, mm -hmm. He writes. He writes everything. He plays on all the records. Um, and so I guess I don't. I think okay. So I think basically Cadaver Dog started playing shows again when uh, Civilized stopped being a band. So Cadaver Dog kind of, you know, stepped up in its place. So we we started playing shows more. And that's like when the LP was being finished and it was going to come out. Um, so, yeah, that's how that basically started. Uh, mm. It just started. I was just asked, to, since I was in his other bands at the time, I, I was just asked to play guitar. I wasn't oh, like okay. an original live member. when I So when I right. saw them in 2012, the backing band was basically guys that went on to be in the live city hunter band so oh okay. I, I ended okay. up playing show yeah i ended up playing in bands with them as well um but yeah it just it's sort of just asked to play um but yeah cadaver dog is still very much just james's thing um mm -hmm. i've i've helped write lyrics but other than that i've, I've never written any music for cadaver dog so so, that's okay. completely completely his thing uh right <laughs> which <laughs> okay. so that but that's that's funny because like back so like for for my bands prior to moving to here there was a there was a one band we had that was really collaborative but then later on i had two hardcore bands that i was in and i i pretty much wrote all the riffs for those bands so when I moved here, um, I was sort of under the impression that most people did it that way, like at least for hardcore bands, because there isn't really a lot of um, there isn't really a lot of like uh, collaboration that needs to be had with like primitive, you know, like just fast hardcore stuff, because it's like it either is or isn't hardcore. So I, I was just always under the impression that most bands did it that way, where it was just one person wrote all the, the songs and uh, just had other people do stuff. I mean, I know yeah. that's not the case, but I, that was just how I thought. So um, I, even before knowing that about Cadaver Dog, I remember seeing them and being like, oh yeah, James is definitely like 
the the guys behind this. Um, oh, okay, okay. It's I, funny I mean, though. I've he's... certainly had experiences like that too, where you know you have one person that's you know solely the dude who's bringing everything, and everybody else is kind of like, yeah, shit, let's let's yeah. go along with it. <laughs> yeah, but sorry, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say contrary to what I originally thought about Civilized, James is also the main songwriter of Civilized as well. We, um, oh, later wow. on, later on, I mean, he was, and he's the drummer. Usually the drummer isn't the one that's writing the yeah. riffs, you know? So, yeah. but that band was, was more collaborative towards the end. Um, I had joined the band right before the seven inch came out, but for the, for the full length, I played, I played bass on it and came up with all of my own parts and stuff. So, okay. Okay. But nice. Yeah. I mean, it, it really just depends. And that's the thing is with goon, that is a totally collaborative band. That's, uh, all the songs. It's usually, um, our singer Alex that comes up with all of the ideas to start, but all of the songs are like painstakingly like, transfigured through band practices like so um that band t it takes a lot longer when when you have four voices that are constantly like meddling with the songs but i think it ends up being um it ends up working out because it's not just it's not just like a meat and potatoes hardcore band so <laughs> we have we have to like really play through it a bunch in order to, you know, see what's working and what's not. So. Sure. I, you know, and that was the next act I was going to mention, uh, uh, you know, or, or touch on highlight, I guess, if you will. Um, you know, and it's hard to say out of, uh, you know, out of all the, uh, all the, you know, acts that we're going to be talking about, but I think goon is, that's the spot for me, man. Like that the, uh, the seven inch <laughs> or EP that you guys put out has yeah. just been uh, the the singer in my band put me onto it i'm just like dude cool this is it like if you find any else anything else like this this is where i'm at <laughs> yeah and, and like i mean it's it's absolutely ripping but like i think when it got to stuck in a trash can where i was like oh okay like i, I this is gonna be something i'm not gonna be able to set aside for a little while and then <laughs> even you have pig and then pig two and then yeah, yeah it, I, I i'm on that man i absolutely love that it's it's so sick and um, I don't know how it was. I think even through we did. I, I well, at least earlier memory was him mentioning convulse, and that was oh, where yeah. we kind of started looking through some of their catalog and different things. And he had sent me that, and uh, I just listened. I'm like, oh my god, this is ridiculous! Like I'm up, obsessed with it. I love that. Um, so now, <laughs> uh, how, how did you end up getting introduced to to that? Uh, to being goon. Goon. Yeah. Yeah. So again, Goon um, started off as a solo project. Um, the singer um, Alex or AP goes by AP Fiedler. He wrote all the music. He recorded this demo, and um, the it's just funny because these bands. It's like these bands have been around forever. Like we started playing in Goon. Like the Goon demo came out in 2015. Um, it just takes us a long time to get all of our stuff together. And, you know, it's the, the goon, the goon LP came out in 2019, which at this mm. point is like almost, it's like two and a half years old, but it's just funny. Cause like, I think I saw something online a couple of days ago that was like, what are your favorite albums from 2021? And I saw somebody put goon natural evil. And I'm just like, <laughs> that thing's like three years old at this point, but I, it's cool. <laughs> it, it's cool that people are still discovering that band because we put a lot of work into that record. Um, but yeah, it started off as a solo project and he wanted to start do, he wanted it to turn into like a real band. So he um he really wanted to play music with me specifically and at the time i'd already was uh in a bunch of other stuff so i was like man i don't i don't know like i really don't know if i can if i'll have time to do this um but i really mm -hmm. wanted to, to make it work because i liked the demo and um, i liked a lot of the influences that he uh, was into at the time he was heavily influenced by like um, the new york uh toxic state scene from like the early 2010s okay. like crazy spirit and uh dawn of humans and stuff like that so um and i like i like crazy spirit still uh to this day but hmm. um um 
but then so he made that demo and it was it was pretty it was pretty like you know and the band and lumpy and the dumpers which they're from st louis they kind of <laughs> what? they kind what of the uh, they're like they're just like a punk band from st louis but like that <laughs> he, that's like my friend from uh martin the singer of that band is like we go way back like me and uh him have played shows for like probably 15 years at this point oh, man. But um, yeah, it's a so sick that, name. <laughs> Lumpy and the Dumpers, yeah. So they 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 kind of took the New York sound and kind of made it more like Midwest. But then, so Alex was inspired by those two bands, or you know, those two scenes specifically. But then, um, as it you know, as we were added to the mix, we kind of took on our own sound and were transforming the songs. Uh, I, I don't know. At the time, I think I just wanted to do something different, um, uh, especially because I was in I was in the you know the I was in Culture Shock and Cadaver Dog and Civilized, and those bands are kind of uh, I don't want to say formulaic, but they're they're very like parametered out. Like uh, mm. every band has their own sound, but it doesn't go outside of the box at all. You know, like you can name. Uh, each band has their own like analogous eighties band, you know, like if, if I had to pick one for cadaver dog, it'd be like, that's a negative, that's negative approach for culture shock. That's SSD for, um, civilized that's <laughs> the today. So, um, and th that's not bad. I'm, those aren't bad things. It's just, yeah, no, it's, um, I, I couldn't do like a bass solo in the middle of a song or something. So <laughs> right. uh, what it, what it did though, was it pushed all the creativity into goon. And from there I was able to build the entire sound the way I wanted to. And a lot of the times with the bands that I do, I, I, I pick, um, a, this is how I, this is how I do it at least with, with my pedals, I pick um, a limited palette of pedals that I want to use, it's, mm. especially with Goon okay. from the very beginning, there's been four pedals that I use for the band. And from there, the songs that I, the songs that I, we rewrite for Goon, all those pedals are always kept in mind. So it's like, they're like extensions of the guitar. So, okay. Um, so naturally the, these pedals I had lying around too, like one of them was intentional, but there's one that I got a gift from my old roommate in Champagne. And it was, it's this like auto wah pedal. It's, so it's basically like a wah pedal, but it's like, you're, you're not in control of how it oscillates or whatever. I'm really okay, like yeah. not a gear person, but this is just like one of those, uh, it's like a Diodaro or not Diodaro. It's, it's whatever, <laughs> the there's it's a really cheap guitar pedal brand that makes all their pedals are named after food so there's like a grilled <laughs> cheese distortion and this one i think <laughs> is yeah so i'm sure somebody watching i'm not knows. a guitar guy so i don't yeah. know what it's i forgot what it, i think i i want to say it starts with a d but it's not diodario those are strings uh I but um, like line six is is that expensive stuff or is that like I think that's pretty Middle cheap, but yeah. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. That's I don't think it's not, I didn't want to say six. that. And you're like, that's all the pedals I have. <laughs> no, I, don't, I also all don't right, want to give away my secret, but at the same time, <laughs> yeah, right, right, I, I sure. do want to, I do want to describe though, that this pedal was just given to me as for as a gift. And I was like, what the hell am I going to use this for auto wall? Like, you know, a wall pedal that you can't control. And yeah. at the, my band in Champagne called Chains Gang. That 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 band, I did use like a wah pedal. I have like a crybaby wah pedal that I would use in oh, it. Oh, okay. Um, and that that was always my, like with my bands that I that were able to kind of go outside the box of punk. I always wanted to do stuff that you know, like a wah pedal in a punk band is different, or you know, you know, psychedelic rock influence into a punk band that's like where mm. goon that's like what i wanted to do with goon just like loud guitars like a delay you know just um and then this like auto wah thing so mm. uh <laughs> but yeah that was always my guitar approach is like i just wanted to like inject something that wasn't 
just like, oh, here's the band with the gear that sounds exactly, you know, like I see it with like death metal right. now. Like everyone's like, oh, you got to get this pedal and this guitar and you got to get this uh, amp. It's like the sound that obituary had or whatever. And it's like, that's just lame to me. Like you're just like, you're just carbon copying carbon. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, that's the cool thing about those bands back then is that they they pioneered their sound because they bought the gear and used it. They didn't, they, when they were getting that stuff, they weren't like, Oh, this is going to be our signature sound. They were just like, this <laughs> yeah, sound, right. they, they were just like, this sounds cool, you know? Right, and then it right. became their sign signature sound. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and, and, and touching on, you know, something not being carbon copied and I have to be fragile with this, this next topic here uh, with, with city hunter, uh, now, of of course, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't want to get into too many specifics. I don't want to get into anything that's going to have me on the uh, on the headhunters list. Uh, but but what, 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 what can you tell us about this act? And uh, there's been mentions of, of you doing some of the photography for, for the for the LP. What can you tell us about this? Yeah. So, um, yeah, City Hunter was a band before I moved to Denver. I remember um, getting the first demo and the youth attack drop uh, just being like blown away by the packaging, just like, uh, you know, emulating a VHS uh, yes. like in the middle in the, like the, the mini cassette uh, case. And then I remember getting it in, uh, in the mail and I was living with my friend Aaron at the time. And we were just like, what the fuck is it? Like, this is next level. Like it wasn't <laughs> even put out by youth attack, but it was just like a distro item. And honestly, to this day, some of the distro stuff is always the coolest, rarest stuff in those youth tech updates. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember. I don't think there's very much info about it, but I kind of figured it was from Denver because at that time, like everything else in the drop was like Denver related. And um, yeah, so before I moved here, I was like a big fan of City Hunter. I was a big fan of Bleak Environment, which is this label um, that my friend Aaron runs. And I didn't know him at the time. I didn't know anybody. I was like obsessed with Tolan Men and uh, just all this stuff that was being distroed by Youth Attack or kind of in the periphery of the time. Um, so then, yeah, I moved here. And then I actually got to see the first City Hunter show before I was in the band. Um it was Man. with Iron Long, and uh, they were they played it as a four piece. So then I was added on as a second guitar player just because I was around and uh, willing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the time they had um, they had already recorded the full length, and um, uh, I guess something happened. Like the guy who recorded it, and I'm not going to name names, but the guy who recorded it. Um, accidentally like lost it or deleted everything except for one song um so Whoa. And this yeah so this would have been they recorded it i think in 2014 um so it was done they had that demo which was in 2014 and um by the time i had moved here there was literally every song for the lp except for i think two or three was written and recorded so the reason why it was delayed is because the record had to be re-recorded entirely. And um, <laughs> oh my god, that's so insane. what a fuck up! Oh my lord! Yeah. So and you know when shit like that happens, it's like it's not like an immediate. All right, guys, let's go back in. It's like yeah, you're kind of just like, well, what do we do now? Um, <laughs> oh man. So then then it was recorded later but so but in the meantime i had written a song for the band um just because i was playing live um with them i got to kind of learn the main songwriters uh i guess the, the way that the song all the songs were written sort of you know how the little tricks that were done on the guitar mm. so then from there i wrote a song um silhouette of death that's the one i wrote um oh and it was sick it was uh it was plussed up by the band but i came up with the riff and um 
then we then another song was written i I can't remember it's one of the shorter ones on the album but that was kind of written right before we went into record and then um yeah so then then it was recorded i played bass like on one song but at this point they recorded since they were already tight as a four piece they all recorded it um they just recorded it and then i kind of filled in for the part like some of the newer songs that uh, needed to be filled in on i I recorded oh, some okay. stuff but um but i was like a live member at the time and then i helped you know write some lyrics and stuff but um <laughs> yeah and then i ended up doing all the so by the time this is how it always happens with um how our album art and stuff comes together it's like it's like something was started a couple years ago it was recorded then there's this huge lull where like one thing needs to be finished like vocals or like just mixing or something and things kind of get dropped and then all of a sudden it's like it's done and then boom like we need artwork so like yeah i I took some of the photos um in uh i work professionally as like a photographer for uh, a company so oh okay that's like my day job uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, I do like commercial photography for the same company. I've been with them since basically since I moved out here. So oh, we just okay. like shot all, we shot this stuff in the studio that I work at. And um, some of it was done elsewhere, but then yeah, Mark kind of just took my photos and uh, manipulated them into like the city backdrop or, you know, but the, the repress actually has more photos because we we did a bunch of additional photos and those are mostly untouched. Mark just kind of made like a a collage of them, um, mm. and those were shot like at a house. So actually, like the one few, with him in the hallway. Houses. Yeah, that was in a few houses. That was at our friend oh, uh, Teresa's house, uh, who does the screen screen. She's the one who does like the horror series in town. Oh, sick! Yeah. Man. I feel bad for her because I see that picture and man, that is eerie as shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having to look down that hallway every night, like, oh boy, I do not want to see those eyes. <laughs> yeah. Some of those, yeah, a lot of those, and like, that's, I've always been that kind of creative, I guess, like, um, you kind of just uh, start doing stuff. Like, there wasn't really like a, um, a plan. We just were like, let's just get as much shots as we can and, uh, try to think of different ways to like while we're in here like the photo of uh just it's i think it's the back cover of the repress where it's just um it's kind of like silhouetted and you kind of just see that was just done on a whim in the backyard of her house and so like that i don't know that's it's always been like that there's never been like a master plan it's kind of just like all right we need something let's just shoot as much as we can and then Mm -hmm. get get stuff um yeah i think uh, when i was talking with mark he had mentioned something about with the cover uh that just being a shot that you randomly took when he just so happened to look in your direction you took it it was just like well that's it (laughs) oh yeah i I could be mixing up stories i I hope that no i hope that not it's not the cover, but there was um, this shot that Mark had posted on uh, the Youth Attack Instagram page, and it was just like kind of a teaser for the album. And it was oh, literally okay. we had I had taken a cell phone photo of my laptop screen of this photo that he so like we just sent him something like, <laughs> "Hey, we're we're working on stuff. Like, here's something cool." And we didn't expect for him to like take that cell phone photo and use it uh, to post it. And it, I mean, it, it was, it was kind of a happy accident. Like I just took, like I said, my, the laptop I was working on had dust all over the screen. So it kind of made it look like there was film grain on it. If you go back on the youth attack page, you can still see it. It's like this red, it's like red. It's got like a red background. I think it, it did end up being used in the repress, like in the photo collage, but. uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, Sick. that was That's a so total, awesome. total happy accident. It's like <laughs> the actual, yeah, the actual photo wasn't that cool looking, but the photo of the photo that I took was actually pretty cool. <laughs> and like Mark, really? Mark, Mark actually tried to get us to recreate it. And I was like, uh, how, how are we going to recreate like this? He wanted us to get like a higher res version of it. And it just didn't end up working out. The, the original one was better. So, oh, okay. Well, 
Well, last up here, uh, as far as musically, Goodbye World, uh, you know, I just wanted you to touch on as far as uh, the, the band and, you know, the releases recording uh, at, at Dead Air Studios. Uh, and, well, you know, what can you tell us about? I, I'm hearing, you know, maybe even rumblings of uh, maybe some new music coming. Is there is there any truth to that? Yeah. Um, so the 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 way the band came together is kind of a long story. <laughs> That I probably like... <laughs> won't mess with. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily want to get into it because... Sure. No, no, no. Whatever, whatever you're I mean, comfortable with, man. It's not, it's not that I'm like... It's more so that like it didn't... The original iteration of the band didn't work out, but the original impetus to start the band was because of, a, I will just say, an unknown celebrity that wanted to be the vocalist for the band. Uh, hmm that approached Mark um, to be in this band because he was a fan of Charles Bronson. Um, but that ended up not working out, but we took it seriously. So Mark, um, when Mark met this person, I don't want to name him just because I don't know if Mark Fair enough. wants me to, I, it's not yeah. that it's a secret. Like I can tell you off air. I just don't want to mm -hmm. air this out on something that's going to be like archived because it didn't end up working out and br bridges were burned. So, uh, mm -hmm. but this person approached Mark at some like gallery meeting or something or some like gal, some, some art event. And he was like, Hey, I know who you are. You're Mark McCoy. And Mark was like, who are you <laughs> kind of? <laughs> and um, so I mean, not in a smug way, but just as in like, I legitimately don't know who you are. And then so the guy was like, I'm a huge fan of Charles Bronson, like, you know, kind of into the whole like power violence thing. Um, and then so Mark being Mark was like, let's start a band. And uh, uh, the guy was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm down. And then, you know, Mark, uh, Mark is somebody who's like really serious when it comes to the stuff. Like he doesn't just say something and then just expect to, to never follow up with it. So mm. right away, Mark started writing all these guitar riffs and like, I don't know, he probably assembled like 15, 10 to 15 songs like immediately. And then he asked um, his old friend, Jeff Jalen to uh, be in the band as well. Then he also asked James, and then from there I was asked to be on bass because he wanted James to drum. So we were all like, "Okay, awesome! Like this is crazy. We're gonna be in a band with this." You know, I wouldn't say like he's like a huge celebrity, but like we were gonna. It just seemed like it was gonna be like something that um, could have maybe been on TV or something. So, hmm. and. Uh, Weird. It's not that, it's, yeah, it's, it is weird. And it's not that that was the reason we like the band has never changed other than this person is not the not being involved. Right. Yeah. So the okay. first LP was written. It wasn't rewritten. <clears throat> it, the style was never going to be different. We, we thought that would be sick for this person to front like a legit sick hardcore band, but they kind of were on a different page. They wanted to do some like Mike Patton thing and like scat over the songs and, and they kept flaking cause they were like making a movie and stuff. So at this, at a certain point, you know, Mark was like, we gotta, we gotta move on. Like this stuff is too good. Cause we had recorded it and the first LP was recorded in, um, it was recorded in 2016. It was recorded right after Civilized recorded our LP. So we had flown oh, okay. back to, to Dead Air, recorded with Mark. Jeff overdubbed all of his guitar stuff from Chicago. And then it was like in limbo for years because we're like, who's going who's gonna to do vocals? And, and this guy kept kind of stringing us along. He's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Like, I just needed to find some time. And Mark was more than willing to go and help him uh write lyrics uh you know find patterns or you know like vocal phrases because we wanted it to be good and we wanted it to still be like a good record you know we didn't want it to be a joke and mm. i'll say this person is a comedian so that was always our hesitation right from the get-go we were like uh hmm. we don't we don't want this to be a joke and he had named the band and i won't say the band what with the what the original band name was going to be because it ended up being used for something he actually did put out 
Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my yeah. God, this is, yeah, so, this, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, totally just ended up kept pushing, you know, pushing it back, pushing it back. I don't remember when Mark was just like, this is it. This is over. Like, fuck this guy forever kind of thing. Like, once you burn your bridges with Mark, it's over. Um, Cause he's burned bridges with a lot of people. And it's, it's more, it's more so like, it's not that he's like, I think more so it was the fact that he felt that uh, this person wasn't taking him seriously when mm. Mark right from the very beginning was like getting to work to get this to, to, to go. Somewhere. You start writing stuff. You start putting in all that. I mean, to one person that might not seem like, work but you don't know the process of like what it took to you know get all of the stuff you know together and especially i mean yeah. if he's writing 13 14 tracks you know and having something like completely all right here it is you know i mean that that's that's busting your ass on something and you know and, and oh, someone yeah. not taking it seriously yeah sure i can it i can was, imagine the reaction <laughs> it was done really quickly too i think they had met in december of 2015 and by may of 2016 the the lp was finished um we had done it we went and recorded it and like immediately finished it so Mm. um so it was in limbo for a really long time and then that's eventually when we were like who's going to do vocals on this like we were all kind of like kicking around names and stuff and then i think mark was just like screw it like why don't we have aaron do it at that at this point i think the repos were kind of already done um so it was just like it was it seemed like a perfect opportunity and then Hmm. uh i think aaron had flown to dead air like right after that and like a pro just like knocked it out and then boom it was just like then the record was out. I think the the only delay on the record was how long it took to actually get. I think we had gotten the Goodbye World LPs almost a year before he got the Mangled State flexies in hand. So, oh damn. Yeah, I think he had had the LPs for Goodbye World like uh, sometime in spring of 2020. So like it didn't come out for a year, and it was like sitting in his house. <laughs> or his apartment oh my god yeah damn, damn. so i mean so, is this kind of the, the situation as far as you guys having new music too has, has this been something that's been that's been together for a while yeah so we recorded the second lp in february of 2020 right before everything like you know the pandemic started so mm. um mm. I don't know what the status is on it. I think it's basically in the mixing phase. I don't, I haven't heard vocals for it, but I know that Aaron has recorded vocals. Um, and then, Oh, sick. So that, I don't know what vinyl is like now, but it'll eventually come out. But we, we already have plans to record the third one this year. So Shit, that's <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. It's just, um, I don't know. Mark's like a machine. Jeff is a machine. I wrote some songs for this new one, but there's just, we just keep adding to the list. Like I think the second, I think we have like 10 more or double the amount of songs that we had already from the first one. So it's just like, it's just going to, it just keeps getting more and more insane. Like (laughs) I remember like the way this band has worked though, is like, we don't, I didn't learn any of the songs before we went into recording. So like we just go in I get taught the song or we all get taught the song and then it's just like recorded right away. So (laughs) it it has that like immediacy to it. And I think the, the method, you know, the process has worked. So, but I mean, Mark's songwriting has gotten just insane. So it's, it's this last time we were there, I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I remember during one of the songs, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, (laughs) <laughs> like and we're just like so tired because we took like a red eye flight to boston and we're just like delirious recording this like you know <laughs> 25 song lp like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> damn that's that's awesome i mean i appreciate you you mentioned the kind of the immediacy of it too you know because just like the urgency behind the riffs and like aaron's you know barking over it and the the drum play like everything about that band i mean it's just kind of one of those things that you sit down and you feel like it's like a like a roller coaster when it just starts to like plummet you're like holy fuck this is not letting up whatsoever and that that's one yeah. of the things i love and appreciate about it so yeah that's sick i, I can't wait to to see the you know, any details or anything new coming out as far as a new record. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So sweet. 
Yeah, um, I was blown away when I first heard Aaron's vocals on the songs because they were they were literally sitting around for like four years before we heard vocals on them. Dang. Okay. Now, from this other previous person, you had never heard anything as far as like there wasn't anything recorded, right? No, there was no attempts. Uh, yeah. Okay. They didn't even. Okay. They was. It was just all. Um, I guess talk. It was just like, oh, I would like to start a band. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Mark, you know, Mark took it seriously. And then I don't know. I guess in an alternate world, it could have happened. But I think he just. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes, but I, I do realize that he was busy. It's just like, I also don't think he thought it was going to be real. I thought he just thought it yeah, was. Yeah, right. Or even. A conversation even, piece. Yeah. Or even just like, oh, I'll, I'll record like just a few songs. I think it was a little intimidating to be like, here's like 15 songs. Like this is a full, <laughs> one. Like, it's not a demo. Like it's not just like, you know, but yeah. Well, I, I, you know, that had to have been, you know, the situation, one of those things where it was like, it was, it was meant to be as far as Aaron stepping in and, you know, it'd be like, well, uh, give me 20 minutes and I've got it. I'll have everything figured yeah. out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sick. And his, his, <laughs> I mean, his lyrics are fucking awesome too. Like, I don't know. I'm a huge fan of the repos. That was like, I don't, I'm a huge fan of all these people, you know, like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Even though James is like one of my best friends, I'm like, I'm still impressed that, I get to play music with him and then to even, to even like include some of these people that I like was listening to in high school. It's just, it's crazy, you know, but <laughs> uh, Aaron's vocals are just so surreal and it, it carries on from the repos. He just has like such a unique and I, from what I was told, he just kind of like all of that was a stream of conscious, like right off the tip of his tongue right before he was recording. And it was just like, dude, how are you even fitting words into these songs? Like, I don't, like, the riffs are so <laughs> yeah. complicated. Like, I, I don't even know how you, he did it, but it's, yeah. Yeah, very, uh, it's, it, it's sick for sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what, uh, what this, what this next full length has, uh, has in store, uh, for all parties alike, honestly, you know, like, like you say, you know, like being a fan of, of, uh, you know, each of the, each of the members stuff and different things that they have going outside of it um yeah it, it's totally sick man i i know that i'm not alone and being being stoked for hearing something new from you guys too so that's awesome thank you yeah <laughs> uh this is this is wrapping up you know as far as our, our music conversation I, I there's gonna be a point in time where we're gonna have to talk some horror uh but wrapping with uh you know that that idea uh i had a, I had a new bit here uh that i've been doing with uh with people you know in the in the film uh, realm or the you know or working in film uh called lo fis video shop so l last up here for our finale what we're gonna do here is i picked out three movies so you know we're gonna go back in the day when you're going to a local video rental okay and you scoured through the the horror movies and i'm gonna show you three different movies that you know based off of the cover art maybe the name maybe something about the movie that just really jumps out to you what would you choose out of these three movies for your 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 Saturday night? You know, with maybe some pizza and a Domino's, you know, uh, or maybe some Pepsi. What what one of these movies would you choose? So I'm going to show you them one by one here, and uh, you know, just just see what you think. All right. So first off, uh, from some from some of your uh, interests that I've seen online and some of the things that you've uh, you know that you've posted watching at the local theater there, uh, I wanted to throw this at you and see if you've ever heard of slime city is this a movie that you've seen before you're you're aware of it all no i can't well, really see the what. cover but yeah no <laughs> okay <laughs> all right I'll, I'll 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 bring it a little closer here i don't know if that's, is it, is that's it any trauma? better no this is from shaka rama uh retro cinema and and to be honest with you i don't even remember it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't i don't remember i i feel like it was something it's from 89 uh, and okay. it was something that it was just I was kind born. of like a, it was it was kind of like a uh, uh, oh my god what's the um, the movie with the the tenafly viper oh my god how can I not think of that movie right now oh um, I just saw it uh, street trash street trash yeah street trash there you go so 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 from that you know just the the cover alone I kind of wondered if that was something that would be in, intriguing to you so number one is slime city. All right, number two. So this is a, this is a movie here uh, that Dario Argento, as well as Lucio Fulci, in the '90s wrote together, along with another another fellow there 
called Wax Mask. Have you ever heard of this this one? No, actually, I haven't. Very, uh, yeah. very, very odd. Uh, takes place in a, in a in a wax museum. Um, this is from Severn. I don't know if you're familiar with with that oh, or yeah. not. Severn, uh, the, yeah. the releasing company, um, Italian, obviously. You know, like with 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 the two fellows there. But you said uh, the nineties. Really, yeah, uh, let early me see 90s? what. I think it's from the early nineties. Let me let me check and make sure here, so I'm not a real big dummy. Ninety seven, actually. So later. Oh, that's holy, later. Holy yeah. moly! Yeah, very very wild. So we have wax mask. And then last up here, you know, just to just to throw a little a little kink in things, try and see uh, what you think of uh, a, a knockoff of the old Gremlins. How about Hobgoblins? Have you ever seen this? I think I have heard of this one. <laughs> I've never seen that one though. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, so out of the, you know you you're going to the local video rental, and out of these three movies, what would what one would 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 capture your interest? What do you bring it home tonight? You got Slime um, City, Wax Mask, and Hobgoblins. Um, so I used to do I actually do this all the time. I would go to the family video. I don't know if they have those in Michigan. Does that sound oh, familiar? Yeah. Family Not video, anymore, yeah. but yeah, they did. Yeah, they're, the family video by my mom's house um, just closed last year. Like it was open all the way up until last year. Whoa! Yeah. Wow. It's, pretty fucking crazy but yeah it's been that, a few years since we've had one around here yeah they lasted a lot longer though because out here the video rental stores were like already gone by the time i moved mm-hmm. here so mm-hmm. but um uh out of those i'd probably pick the argento one yeah what okay. did you say right. fulci and argento yeah both yeah. Of, both were, were writing parties yeah so initially the the story behind that i think was Dario Argento wanted Lucio Fulci to to direct it, and then they ended up getting somebody else to direct it. But they wrote the movie together, and it took a okay. while to get production made. Uh, I think maybe even one of them ended up. Pe- well, let's see. I think maybe Dario Dario Argento is still alive, right? Uh, I think so. I'm gonna make myself <laughs> look like an asshole right now, but I, I think the story went with somebody ended up passing, and so they they passed oh, no, along the torch. He's definitely alive. Because uh, he was okay. in the new Gaspar Noe movie. Uh, he was in a movie oh, called Oh yeah, Vortex. that's right. I just I that's just saw right. that last year. So. Okay, okay. I haven't seen that yet. I've I've heard of it, but I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it was maybe it was Lucio Lucio Fulci. Yeah, um, probably. Either way, I'll stop talking about death. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> these, no these we can talk about alive that. to us. You know. <laughs> so uh okay yeah so uh yeah wax mask for sure if uh if i have like a digital code or something to to find online i'll definitely uh send it there to you and uh, yeah try it try and have it you know, check it out because that movie yeah, is sick for sure my thing is to just rent stuff off youtube that's what yeah. i do that's yeah. what i mainly do if it's not on uh shutter or whatever mm, okay i think it is on shutter actually oh okay so if you have that dude that's, yeah, that's the move. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude, this has been absolutely so awesome. Uh, once again, I really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate hearing all the stuff that you got coming, all the stuff that you have put out. Uh, this has been so sick. Well over the hour that I requested, but uh, I, I appreciate oh, you yeah. taking the time, by the way, man. I know what time it is. <sighs> it's probably getting late over there, though. Yeah, it's just about 11, but you know, we're, we're good, man. I appreciate it. This is awesome. Thank you very much. Once again, John, I think the, the sun just set over here, so it's not that late. <laughs> oh, damn. All right. Awesome. <laughs> still, still some of the night, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, uh, you, you take care. And if uh, anybody's watching, didn't catch this whole thing, I'll have it up on YouTube here, uh, within next cool. month. Um, I'll have all of this month's episodes up too. So yeah, once again, thank you very much, man. You take yeah, care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. See ya. Bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, baby, baby. Lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.